I was recently asked by one of my subscribers to do a shop tour video, so I saved that idea for a wintertime video when things are slow, so I hope you enjoy it. This started out as a wood shop, oh, maybe 15 years ago or so. And I insulated the garage door as well as insulated all the walls. And I used white pegboard to cover it. Now the pegboard is kind of neat, but there's advantages and disadvantages to it. The advantage to using pegboard is that you can get a lot of storage space on your walls. The disadvantage of using a pegboard is you can get a lot of storage space on your walls and it can look cluttered. So at some point I really need to go through and organize things maybe a little bit better. But for now, this is the way it is. And I live in the upper Midwest where it can get cold in the winter time. However, with the insulated walls and insulated garage door, I can use a catalytic heater and I can get about 30 to 35 degrees above outside temperature. So I can get it quite nice in here. And I'll begin on the back wall. On the left side, I have a storage rack where I keep the tools I don't use very often. Then next to that is where I have my welder and the welding table. And of course, whenever I use that, I pull it out from the storage area into the center of the room. And I also have a nice set of Bessie clamps. And if you are a woodworker, you know you can never have enough clamps. Eight foot ladder. And as we continue around the room, this is a router cabinet. I built a cabinet myself, built it out of oak, and it has a woodpecker's router top along with a router lift and an INCRA LS fence. And I have a three and a half horsepower Milwaukee router. And this is a Unilift by Woodpeckers. And when you put the crank in, each revolution of this crank is 1 16th of an inch up and down. And next to that, right here, we have a jet dust collection system with a four inch tube that goes all the way down the length of the shop. And next up is my table saw. This is a jet 10 inch belt drive saw. And I do have an INCRA miter gauge. And this is called a shop stop. It's actually a very accurate miter gauge. And next up, I have actually a 12 foot ladder. And it's so tall that it goes through the ceiling. And I use this for when I want to get on my RV roof or if I want to get next to the RV without actually going on the roof. And it's the podium style ladder. So if you've ever watched a marching band at a football game and the conductor gets up on a ladder, you'll know what a podium style ladder is. And next to that I have my bench vise. I used to have my vise on the work table, but it was always in the way. When it's on a stand like this, it's every bit as sturdy as being on a table. And I can move the stand out in the middle of the floor and have 360 degree access. So this works out much better. And next to that is my Delta bench grinder and a woodworking lathe. And I've got all these blow molded cases up here. I just have no idea what to do to store them. I probably should just throw the cases away and just put the tools somewhere. But for now, they're just hanging on the wall. Also, I have a drill press, which I've done some modification to. I've put a LED light on it here and a hose to a vacuum here. And I also have a laser that I can turn on. And as you can see, it shows you exactly where you're going to drill the hole. And then here I have what I call my poor man's milling machine. This is an XY table so I can move the sled sideways or front to back and been successful in doing light gauge metals such as aluminum but the main weakness of the thing is the quill on the chuck and actually I've knocked a quill off <laughs> come flying off before when trying to do milling and if I take the vise off I can bolt this tabletop to the drill press and again I have another inker fence and inker positioner and then finally on this side of the room I do have a jet bandsaw so let's kind of go over to the other side of the room. And I have a shelving unit here. In the bottom I have my Honda EU2000, which I use for the few times we go boondocking, along with a DeWalt surface planer. One row up, I do have a Boss Stitch small air compressor. And I used to have a larger air compressor, but then when I went into investing heavily into cordless drills and such, 
I didn't need a big air compressor anymore, so I just got rid of it because I needed a shop room and I just bought a small one. And one row up from there, this is where I have all my hardware and all these boxes. And one project that I want to do this winter if I have time is I would like to weld up a heavy duty version and then put every one of those boxes on kind of a piece of angle iron so they'll slide in and out individually so I can get to my hardware much easier. And I'd like to have 24 or 36 of those boxes. Next up, I have my Craftsman tool set and I have a base cabinet and two intermediate cabinets and a top cabinet. And in fact, it is so close to the top of the ceiling, you can see that the railing for the garage door goes right through the top of the cabinet. In fact, I can't close the top of the cabinet because that railing is in the way. And this cabinet stack is just about seven foot high. And I'm 6'2", and I need to have a ladder actually to see what's in the top few drawers. Now, Craftsman recommends not using more than one intermediate cabinet where I have two. I've had it in this configuration for at least a dozen years. It's never failed. So I don't really see an issue with stacking a couple of the intermediate cabinets. I have a second tool cabinet. Again, Craftsman bottom. Uh, this time we have Performax intermediate cabinets and a Performax top cabinet, which is about six foot tall. And if you didn't know, Performax is basically a Menards store brand. Menards being a Midwest, mostly, big box store equivalent to Lowe's or Home Depot. And finally, this is my workbench. This is actually a Craftsman workbench that I've had for at least 20 years. And you may be a little familiar with this top because I've done some videos on this top. But the problem is, being a dark top, it really messes with the camera's exposure levels. So I don't really get that good of a video and a record on the top. So I went out and bought this pad. And it's green on one side, blue on the other side. And I'm hoping that when I do future videos, it will show up better. And on the top here, this was an evolutionary process. It started out with two shelf units, then it became three, then it became four. And then I drilled notches, so I had room for all my cordless tools. To the left, I have port cable To the right, I have Bosch. And then to the far left, I have 12-volt Bosch tools. And to the far right, I have 12-volt Milwaukee tools. So you might have a question, why have so many different battery systems? And to me, it doesn't really matter that you have different battery systems because the only difference is the charger. And the charger is by far the cheapest item in the system. And each brand has different offerings. So this allows you to get the tools you want from each brand. You're going to need a minimum number of batteries anyway. So, for example, if I had 10 Bosch tools and 5 batteries, what's the difference between that and having 5 Porter Cable and 5 Bosch and 2 or 3 batteries of each? The only difference, again, is just the charger. So here's a sports quiz. Can anybody tell me what the difference is between these two batteries? If you said one is 20 volts and one is 18 volts, you would be wrong. They're both 18 volt batteries. Porter Cable as well as DeWalt are disingenuous in their advertising. And I can prove that by showing you the disclaimer that they put on their product. The 20 volt Porter Cable and DeWalt batteries use the same 18650 lithium iron batteries as used in Bosch and other brand tools. In a lithium iron battery, the long term average voltage is 3.6 volts per cell. There is a short peak voltage of 4 volts 100% full, but quickly drops to 3.6 volts as the battery is discharged. Calling a 5 cell battery a 20 volt battery, which is 4 volts times 5, is a bit deceptive as it is only 20 volts for a short period of time. Calling the battery an 18 volt battery reflects its true long term average voltage. And there would be nothing to prevent Bosch or Milwaukee from claiming they also have 20 volt batteries. Same thing goes with manufacturers that produce 24 volt batteries. These are 6 cell batteries, but use the same trickery as these are actually 21.6 volt batteries. Thing is, if it is a lithium ion battery, they are 3.6 volts per cell, period. So you're getting no advantage by buying a 20 volt battery versus an 18 volt battery. They're essentially identical. And when I say identical, we are talking about the voltages. The amp hour rating can be different because the batteries can have different capacities, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the 18 volt versus 20 volt issue. 
So here we are in my electronics lab. I have my 3D printer here. This is an Ender 3 3D printer. And I have uh, that white box is my Synology network attached storage station. And it's not only where I keep all of my backups, but it also has an integrated website. And so for my website, I do all the testing in that box. And then I ship it off to an online website when I'm happy that it's working correctly. This is a USB charging station and has the ability to charge up to eight devices at once. Plus I have battery charging here for AAA and AA, as well as for lithium ion batteries here. And then next door, this is my combination desktop and electronics lab. And next to it, I do have a window to the outside world and my soldering station. This beam here, this is actually for cameras. So I can point a camera straight down onto this pad and that's where I do some of the close-ups. And I have a four channel oscilloscope, a Rigol DS1054, a Rigol arbitrary waveform generator, a Rigol precision voltmeter, and a iTech electronic load. And if you don't know who iTech is, they're actually the OEM for BK Precision. And then finally on this side I have a power supply. One thing about this arbitrary waveform generator that I find so cool is not only can you do sine waves, square waves, triangle waves like a standard function generator would, but you can go to an arbitrary waveform. There are probably 50 different built-in waveforms. Here we have a sync pulse, TV signal, and we drop down to medical, we have a cardiac waveform. So you could design a heart rate monitor and hook it up to this and you could output a cardiac heartbeat. Here's what ignition looks like. And then we have several different ISO waveforms and these are all different types of transients. When I did the uh, design work on the transient surge suppressors, I hit them with this. My precision six digit multimeter. You can do frequency, capacitance, and a whole host of other things. This is one of the more unique pieces of equipment. This is an electronic load. Well, if you have a power supply or a battery or even a power amplifier, you can stress test the output stage, set this up to be an 8 ohm load. And so basically it's kind of a verbal resistor in some respects. It also has a battery test mode. You can plot the discharge curve of the battery. Remember our discussion earlier in the shop about 20 volt power tool batteries? I use this electronic load to discharge a 18650 battery and plotted the discharge curve here and this is what I came up with. When the battery is 100% charged, the battery will output 4 volts for a short period of time as shown in a circle to the left. And when the battery is completely discharged, it rapidly loses voltage as shown by the circle on the right. And between those two points, the battery outputs a relatively constant voltage, which is the long-term average voltage. And for a lithium battery, this is 3.6 volts. And again, 3.6 volts times 5 equals 18 volts. So a 20 volt power tool battery actually does not exist. And then finally, this is my 27 inch iMac, and this is where I do all my video editing. Now some YouTubers, they just turn a camera on it and then after a period of time they upload it. Well, I don't do it that way. What I do is I create a bunch of video clips and then I stitch the clips together in editing and that's what I do here on the Mac. So for example, I may say the wrong words, I may sigh, can't understand what I said so I have to repeat it. A dog might be barking or a car might be backfiring or whatever noise may be there, uh, you know, wind or whatever. So I always edit my videos and sometimes the clip is just unusable, you know, maybe it's windy and you can't hear what I'm saying. So I'll completely dub over that if I need to. You know, that takes time. I hope you enjoyed my little tour. Uh, hopefully I didn't uh, extend it too much. And it kind of gives you an insight of how I do things in the project world and some of the tools I use. If something that you've seen piques your interest and you want to know more about it, shout out in the comment below. Then I'll get back with you. Visit rv-project.com.